I'm Patrick Toa from IBM Research Zurich, and the following presentation is about short threshold dynamic group signatures. It is based on joint work with Jan Kamenich, Manu Divers, Anja Lehmann, and Gregory Nevin. Group signatures are a fundamental primitive in cryptography. They allow members of a user group to anonymously sign on behalf of the group after being added by an issuer. In other words, anyone can verify that a signature was computed by a group member but only a designated authority called opener can infer any information about a specific signer. Dynamic groups allow, us allow users to join at any time and are therefore more flexible than static ones. The rest of the presentation is only about dynamic group signature schemes. The anonymity requirement of a group signature scheme is that as long as the opener is honest, and even if the issue is corrupt, no information about the signer of a message can be inferred by a computationally bounded adversary. As for the traceability requirement, it states that as long as the issuer is honest, and even if the opener is corrupt, any valid signature can only have been computed by an honest by a group member. It means that an adversary can compute a valid signature only by corrupting a user that has joined the group. In certain definitions and schemes, the roles of issuer and opener are combined. The result is single authority is often referred to as group manager. Due to their anonymity guarantees, group signatures have applications in various scenarios which are privacy sensitive. These include, for instance, vehicle to vehicle communication systems. In such systems, vehicles must be able to authenticate the messages they exchange, but without being traceable by eavesdroppers. Another example is that of trusted party modules. Such modules must be able to certify that certain messages were computed by accredited devices, but without revealing any information beyond that. One can then see that group signatures definitely fit the bill for these applications. And even though uh, privacy is critical for these applications, the formal definitions of group signatures that have so far been proposed required to trust single entities for issuance and opening. And this comes as a surprise as usually when privacy is the main concern, one tries to minimize the, assum the trust assumptions on single parties as much as possible. It then only seems natural to want to distribute the roles of issuer and opener of all several entities and guarantee that the scheme remains secure as long as less than a no threshold number of these entities are corrupt. To understand how these issues can be solved for certain schemes, it might be helpful to first have a look at the classical constructions and the main underlying ideas. The usual approach for group signatures with separate authorities is to have the issuer certify user public keys by signing them. Then to sign a message M, the user simply signs the message with her corresponding secret key. And to guarantee anonymity and traceability, the user encrypts her public key with, respect with, the public key, with the encryption key of the opener. This guarantees that only the opener can reveal the identity of, her, um, of a signer. And she also proves that she correctly did everything, meaning that she proves that the message passes the verification with respect to her encrypted public key. And uh, she also proves that it's really her that is uh, her that is, is her that is this public key that is encrypted in the ciphertext, and very important. And what one aspect which is very important here is that she also um, proves that her public key was signed by the manager. This prevents, for instance, any party to uh, from any party from uh, computing valid group signatures without actually being a valid group member. The, uh, the, the, on, on the positive side here, the decryption key of the opener can easily be distributed so that threshold opening can easily be achieved. On the, neg on the negative side, threshold issuance is less obvious as, um, but it's not completely impossible either. But the really critical part here is the size of the group signatures and uh, the ciphertext which encrypts the user public key and the proofs of knowledge and the proofs of knowledge of correct computation is actually what makes uh, what makes the, the signatures that large, and this is what one would, would like to get rid of. 
and especially for privacy for for applications especially for applications where the, the group signature size are really critical like for vehicle to vehicle communication system where bandwidth constraints are really strict so uh, the most efficient schemes to date are due to uh, Poncheval and Sanders and they're an adaptation of the scheme of pixel AI. Um, what it simply did was to replace the underlying combination list on sky as uh, multi-signature scheme uh, signature schemes with more efficient with the more efficient Poncheval Sanders signature schemes. One aspect of these group signatures is that uh, the roles of uh, the issuer and the opener combined, and this is extremely important for to allow for both traceability and to both to allow for traceability by having very short group signatures. And I'm about to explain why. So to add a user to the group, the the manager signs blindly signs the user key, and the really critical, the really interesting aspect here of the PS uh, Poncheval Sanders signature scheme is that the the signatures are randomizable and one can e efficiently prove knowledge of uh, signatures and in the process the the op the manager also store an opening handle that is related to the user secret key to sign a message the user simply re-randomizes her signatures from the manager and proves that she knows the secret key for which it is a valid signature with respect to the manager's public key she includes the message in the hash computation of the proof challenge. To verify the group, the group signature, it suffices to verify the proof. To open a valid signature, the manager simply um, the manager simply tests the randomized part of the group signature against the opening handle of each user, and then returns the identity of the first user that matches. The main benefit of this approach is that, is that it doesn't use any encryption to allow for traceability, and instead leverages opening handles that are stored during issuance. But there are several issues with this approach, especially if one aims at distributing the rules of issuers and openers. The first is that there is a single manager responsible for both issuance and opening, and this is crucial for the scheme as the manager must store opening handle on the handles for each member, an opening handle for each member, to later be able to open signatures if necessary. Another issue is that even if one were willing to tolerate the combination of these roles, but still require to have several managers, distributing the computation of CL and PS signatures is not as immediate as they would, requ as they re would require to the signers to agree on a common randomness in a secure way. To summarize, the ideal situation would be to have separate issuance and opening rules and have several parties responsible for each role so that even if some of them are corrupt, but not all, the scheme remains secure. But not only that, the goal is also to eventually have a construction that does not rely on encryption just to keep the signatures as short as possible to allow for practical applications. In other words, be as efficient as the guest shorty approach, but with multiple separate authorities. And that is the main challenge. As a first contribution, the paper formally defines threshold dynamic group signatures and their security. The anonymity definition in this case states that as long as at most TO out of NO openers are corrupt, an attacker should not be able to deduce any information about a signer. Even though the strongest notion is achieved when all issuers are corrupt, the definition introduces a parameter TI star for the number of issuers that can be corrupt by the adversary. The reason is that requiring some use issuers to be corrupt may allow for more efficient schemes than if all were corrupt necessarily. It should also be stressed that the definition does not assume honest key generation for corrupt parties. In a similar fashion, threshold, threshold traceability is also defined. It requires that as long as at most TI out of NI issuers are corrupt, an attacker cannot forge a valid signature, a computer signature that does not open or on which the openers do not agree. The definitions also include, uh, the definition also include a parameter T or star for the number of openers that can be corrupt. It's important to here remark that if opening is stateful, as is for instance the case with opening registers, at least TO plus one openers will be honest in the traceability definition, as the definition requires to be able to open the challenge signature. 
given these definitions, now the main construction of the paper can be described. During setup, the issuers run the distributed key generation protocol for discrete log keys due to Gennaro, Jarecki, Kraftcheck, and Rabin to generate keys for the Poinche Valsander's signature scheme. The fact that the scheme uses this protocol directly implies that less than half of the issuers can ever be corrupt, as the DKG protocol can be robust only under this condition. As for the openers, they separately generate pairs of keys for the Elgamal encryption scheme. During issuance with TI issuers, the user first compute shares of her secret key with the TO out of NO secret sharing scheme. From these shares, she computes opening handles, opening handles that she encrypts with the opener public keys, and then she proves that she correctly did so. She writes the ciphertext and the proof on an append-only ledger that is available to all parties in the system. If the proof is correct and the issuers can verify this with respect to the opener public keys, even if they do not know the corresponding secret key, keys, each issuer blindly computes a PS signature share on the user's secret key. To agree on a common randomness, the trick is here to hash the user identity with the hash function model as, a, as the random oracle. The user can then combine the signature shares to obtain a full PS signature. To sign, it is exactly as before with a get shorty approach, meaning that the user re-randomizes the PS signature from the issuers and computes the signature of knowledge on the message of a secret key which passes the verification with the re-randomized signature. To verify the, sign the group signature, it suffices to verify the signature of knowledge. Now consider the opening of a signature on the message M with a set of TO plus one openers. Each opener first consults the ledger and uh, decrypts the handles. The next step is to derive from each opening handle, uh, from each opening handle share, another handle that is still related to the user secret key share, but absolutely bound to the signature being open. This is crucial to prevent the adversary from opening multi-signatures with a single query in the anonymity game. Now for all the user identities, each opener broadcasts uh, to all the other openers the opening handles tied to the signature being open. With TO plus one handles for the same user identity, each opener can reconstruct a handle tied to the full user secret key and then test the randomized part of the group signature against the full handle. In terms of efficiency, the group signatures only consist of two first group elements and three exponents. The signing and verification costs are also relatively low. And the scheme generally supports a corruption of less than half of the authorities. The full version of the paper also presents a construction without ledger. The downside of this construction is that although the, issuer, uh, the issuance and opening are still fully threshold, it now requires the roles of opener and uh, of issuer and an opener to be combined in you. The main idea here is just to introduce a corruption threshold TC that is different from the issuance and corruption thresholds. The issuance and corruption thresholds here are assumed to be the same T for simplicity, but it could of course be totally distinct. The trick is now to set T and TC so that for any user identity, any set of opening managers always contain at least one honest manager that added her. This is absolutely necessary as there is no longer a ledger that allows the opening managers to recover information from the issuance protocol, from the issuance protocol executions. So enforcing that there's at least one honest manager that added every user identity whenever one wants to open a signature guarantees that this honest manager would always follow the protocol and then also allow the other, the other opening managers to recover all the necessary information to open. The threshold T, the threshold T here should also, uh, so now the threshold T should also uh, not be too large to be able to securely generate keys with the DKG protocol. 
of course, like uh, the reason is that um, the DKG pro to be able to execute the DKG protocol until the end, the number of honest uh, parties will always be greater than uh, the issuance threshold than the than the target threshold T, and this is the reason why T cannot be too large. And with these ideas, then following the same principles as before, one can compute, one can construct a group signature scheme with combined roles, but with several managers. And the uh, issuance and opening is still fully threshold with this construction. Another contribution in, uh, presented in the full version is a scheme with distributed issuance and threshold opening that is based on a novel Pranchival Sanders multi signature scheme. This, this multi-signature scheme allows for, multi for efficient zero-knowledge proofs of knowledge of multi-signatures and is in its own uh, contribution of independent interest. So the scheme is described in the paper and also proof secure and can have uh, applications in other privacy, uh, privacy uh, preserving uh, um, scenarios. The only downside of this group signature scheme is that it requires the participation of all issuers as it is based on a multi-signature scheme, meaning that all the issuers must sign the user secret keys. But the benefit here is that it allows for the corruption of all issuers but one, meaning that it overcomes the NI over two bound that was inherited from the DKG protocol. That is all for this short presentation. Please have a look at the paper for more detail. About this, for more details about the scheme or the security definitions. And feel free to send an email to the author should you have any question. Thank you.